That's what leads. BRICS leaders and delegates have agreed on guiding principles and criteria for expansion of the bloc. And six countries are joining the bloc from January. Today, the BRICS summit is also hosting leaders from Africa and the Global South in the BRICS Africa Outreach and BRICS Plus Dialogue. ENCA's Rofio Matena is at the Santon Convention Center with the latest. Uh, Rofio, I understand that uh, they are preparing uh, for some sort of briefing in plenary uh, happening quite soon. Yes, indeed they are. Um, it's got to do with the United Nations uh, and it's actually had a bit of an impact on our little reporter roundtable that I was hoping we'd end off um, the BRICS summit with because Sipa Mandlagoge has now uh, been deployed to go and cover that important uh, session that's going to be happening while the heads of states, there were 65 of them that attended, all speaking and, uh, and weighing in on the developments of the summit. But yes, Masako, you, myself and Heidi are going to reflect on the last three days in this uh, mini round table. Um, I think it's important because there was um, an overwhelming amount of information and a number of things that happened uh, at various parts of the city throughout the summit, whether it was protests and uh, meetings at hotels, um, that was done and Heidi was on some of it. So I'm just going to ask you, Heidi, I mean, you've had, you, you came back from a bit of a break. <laughs> and you straight into, it. straight into the deep end. Um, and um, it was interesting some of the things that you covered here uh, because it included um, the trade fair at Gallagher Estate. Um, and that was basically to show potential investors, uh, the uh, member states, and the related stakeholders that there are tangible things that we are producing and that we can sell, export, import, whatever it may be. Tell us about that. Certainly. So, yes, I did come back from a break straight into it. But uh, it's definitely something that uh, the trade fair, that is, that uh, was really enlightening because you had South African companies really trying to find uh, South African solutions, but not only for South Africa, perhaps for the continent and globally. Um, we specifically spoke to two companies on uh, day one of the BRICS summits. It was uh, great. Green Scooter and Siga E-Mobility. Now, both of them uh, specialize in the transport sector, uh, but they are looking at, and they have actually gone a lot greener, uh, Ropiwa, and the reason for this is because we have a major climate crisis at the moment. So uh, Green Scooter is looking at uh, just pure electric scooters. Um, they obviously supply um, to transport goods and services, and the big question for me was, why on earth would you go green, or why on earth, rather, would you go electric? when we have this massive energy crisis yeah. um, and uh you know, if you outweigh, if you look at both of the options, it's best to rather go green because of what's happening uh, with the environment. So that was an interesting entrepreneur that we spoke to that's really trying to look at also exploring further onto the African continent. And then Siga e Mobility provides buses to, for example, uh, my city in uh, the Western Cape, as well as how train buses that we see all around here in uh, Johannesburg. So uh, that was interesting to see how they're really looking at global problems and South Africa and Southern Africa is not isolated from these global problems such as climate change. So that was interesting to start off with, to see how these different companies are really trying to look at and businesses are trying to look at finding solutions. And uh, you had um, you know, officials, governments actually going to uh, the trade fair to look at these companies. So it was definitely an opportunity for South African and local companies to showcase, to showcase their brand. And if that wasn't enough uh, for a Tuesday, you then went on to follow a Brazilian delegation that met with uh, the ANC. What was that about? And then afterwards, you went over uh, to, uh, I think that was probably what the, the Chinese the, uh, yes, delegation. Yes, the briefing. Chinese yes. delegation. Yes, yeah, so there's, well. there's a lot that's happening. I mean, every hour there's some sort of briefing or some sort of discussion or delegation that's meeting with our government. But what was interesting is that we saw the ANC chairperson, uh, Gweda Mantashe, together with the Secretary General of the ANC, Tequila Mbalula, and a number of ANC officials officials 
as well as the SACP and COSATU meeting with uh, the Brazilian president, Lula da Silva. And one would ask, why would uh, the ruling party yeah. uh, in their capacity meet with a head of state such as the Brazilian president? Um, but they wanted to engage with him because of uh, the turbulence that he faced as a president, the issues that Brazil is going through. And what was interesting was that there was a discussion about coalitions. And we all know that currently in South Africa, specifically here in the city of Johannesburg, there's a major issue with political parties not really seeing eye to eye as much as they are supposed to because coalitions seem to be the way forward now. Um, they had a discussion about that. There was also a discussion about the energy crisis, and that was asked to Guido Mantashe about whether or not that was discussed and how Brazil can facilitate it all in that way. And he answered in the capacity of uh, energy um, or a mineral resources minister, saying, uh, in actual fact, it's China that can help us better. And then soon after that, we saw that memorandum of cooperation being announced between China and South Africa. So, um, you know, there was a lot that was discussed about what we can learn, because as much as we are on the other side of the world, there's definitely a lot that we can draw from and we can learn, because there are parts of the BRICS. There are uh, parts of the BRICS block, and this is why these discussions need to be had. Yeah, I'm a Sakharov, I don't know if you want to weigh in here, the interesting thing about Brazil as well is they were able to clean up a very corrupt government um, after the ousting of the last president, who, by the way, faced criminal charges and I think may, might have been convicted as well. So uh, I hope that the ruling party asked her, how exactly do we clean up government of the malfeasance? Uh, but anyway, that's a conversation for another time. Uh, did you find anything interesting in uh, those particular events, Masako, and how they are looking looking to advance our trade and investment uh, between the trading bloc. I did find it quite interesting uh, to hear most of the conversations that have been happening throughout the course of the week. Uh, for me, of course, it was some of the things that were said by, for instance, uh, the president of China, President Xi Jinping. He's been uh, quite, um, you know, he's been quite clear in terms of what China is trying to achieve uh, by opening up the bloc and expanding it. They've been all about expansion. But what I also enjoyed, Rafua, is that if you look at the fact that at least with South Africa and what we've been saying uh, since 2015, when we've been 2018 again. In fact, I think it was 2013 and then 2018. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, Rafua. Uh, but the presidents that were at the helm then uh, have always uh, expressed how important it was to uh, include the entire African continent. Uh, it was something that South Africa has been fighting for for quite some time. And I think we also won here today with the fact that uh, we have two new uh, members of the bloc that will join from January that are also from this particular continent. So it's not only China that won uh, when I look at it. Um in terms of what they've been pushing every time they would host in 2022. They invited the AU there because they've been wanting the expansion to happen more rapidly than the rest of the members. Uh, we've also won in that at least Ethiopia and Egypt are part of it, and that is what we've been calling for. Uh, but uh, uh, what I've also been finding interesting, Rofua, is that uh, they've been emphasizing, like I said, with the Chinese president as well, that it's not necessarily them wanting to be uh, the um, geopolitical rival of the West, right? They wanted polarization to happen. Mm. They want trade to be able to happen with any other currency and they want the global south as an emerging market and growing countries to also be recognized so that not everything is dictated by one country or one uh, region of the world, right? But I'm interested to know how uh, it is for you and Heidi, and you'll pass my question to Heidi in case she can't hear me, um, you know, covering the BRICS summit. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot of people saying on social Social media that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa performed well as a president and that he was in his element, etc. I'm not there, uh, and you guys are to be able to tell us as viewers if you think it went well. Was everything running smoothly? Did our government do well to represent us as the host country? Um, yes, Masako, I will pass on the, uh, the question to Heidi and we'll both weigh in on it. But I must tell you, uh, earlier on you corrected yourself saying Egypt is part of Africa. I, in fact, spoke to an international relations expert uh, earlier this afternoon, when uh, this morning rather, when that announcement was made as Tembile Fakude, and he said 
Egypt is African by geographic um, location only. It sees itself as part of the Arab states uh, in the world. So uh, you weren't completely wrong when you left out Egypt when you mentioned uh, the additional African countries that are now part of the trading bloc. They identify um, as part of the Arab states um, in the Middle East. But uh, yes, your question about our experience of covering it and things going smoothly, um, a little bit overwhelming. You do have a situation where you've got heads of state, which are the most protected uh, politicians on the African continent, because they were here on the African continent. So there's a logistical nightmare at some point, and the rigorous security uh, and the checks that you have to go through. But apart um, from all of those logistics, um, it was well coordinated in a sense that everything that they said was going to happen did happen, albeit uh, starting late at times. Um, it was a little bit uh, difficult to get uh, delegates from other parts of the, uh, of the uh, BRICS trading bloc to talk to us uh, because they obviously have a bureaucratic model that they follow when it comes to media requests. It's not a, a South African situation where if you see a minister of electricity, you just, hey, minister, can I talk to you for five minutes? It's not that way in countries like China and Russia and India. And there was certain protocol that unfortunately resulted in us uh, not getting as many of, of those voices uh, as we probably could have. Uh, what, what was your experience? Yes, certainly. I think um, I think it was, it's been a great experience. I think a lot still is going to happen this afternoon. So I don't want to say it's been a great success because we don't know what's going to happen later this afternoon. <laughs> I'm not trying to be negative. Um, but I think it's been very well organized. Something, though, that I really want to highlight. Um, and people might look at me and go, what is she saying? But I was so fascinated by the military jets. And this is not the first time I'm seeing a military jet um, actually or hearing, uh, one. or hearing one because yeah. uh, the island that my parents originate from, it's a military island. So you constantly hear these military jets. But here in South Africa, in Santon, for the first, when I heard it for the first time, I, I, I couldn't understand what was going on. It's, it literally sounded... It sounded so peculiar, but um, there's been a lot of fascination also about that. Um, I, you know, when I was at home this morning, um, there were people in, in the area that were like, what is that? So uh, that has been quite quite a, a fascination for me. But overall, I think it's been a great discussion, a great engagement. As you rightfully indicate, um, Ropiwa, it's very difficult to engage with different countries and to, you know, request these interviews. It's not something that's, um, you know, as simple as it is here in, in South Africa, also because our constitution clearly states that there should be media freedom and access and uh, government officials have, uh, you know, it's, they, they're obligated to engage with the public and the South African media. Um, but uh, that's, in that sense, it has been a little bit um, difficult and a little bit challenging. What was also interesting, though, was that the protesters, I mean, South Africa is known to protest, uh, they were moved away because this area has been declared as a red zone. So people cannot be moving in and out as they please, only if you are strictly accredited. Yeah. So the fact that people were moved away from this area to protest will show their dissatisfaction for whatever reason. That was quite an interesting element. Yeah, and um, I'm going to get Heidi to weigh in on the protest because because she did get to engage different groupings that have various concerns about the conduct of some of the BRICS nations or the interventions they would like the BRICS nations to have um, in uh, volatile uh, or conflict-ridden situations. Uh, but before I do that, um, I want to relate the unhappiness or the concern to that conversation around President Emmanuel Macron that we uh, both had earlier, actually, and the um, desperation, if you will, of francophone uh, nations to be able to gain that independence. And the president inviting himself actually came out as one of the top topics for myself, a learning experience, this uh, notion of the continuous neocolonialism where the, um, the francophone states don't even control their own currency. So the, how do they then um, um, trade and invest with BRICS nations when they don't even control their own currency. So I want to get your thoughts on that part of the conversation because um, it's not all great, happy agreement signing. There are legitimate concerns where African countries are still going to be on the back foot, unfortunately. 
And Rafua, you know, before I give you, uh, you know, what my thoughts are around that, uh, you're quite right when it comes to Egypt. It's the same way, uh, you know, it's quite tricky when it comes to a country like Morocco because at some point they even released a statement saying it's false news that they're trying to join to join the BRICS bloc and they're saying when South Africa, apparently they were quoted as saying when South Africa speaks on behalf of Africa, they will not be speaking on behalf of them. So I guess that's why uh, that uh, analyst you're saying you, sp you spoke to earlier was saying Egypt is only a part of the continent by, uh, you know, mere uh, geographics. But, you know, when it comes to um, Emmanuel Macron, uh, you know, Rafua, there's many African countries that were colonized by Africa uh, at, uh, you know, those dark years ago uh, that are now, for instance, um, you know, uh, a car as a country. Some of them, even the Democratic Republic of Congo, they tr they're starting to shun yeah. on France as their colonizer. Some of them are even uh, deciding not to uh, have uh, French as the medium of instruction. And therefore, it was a desperate attempt, I think, uh, by um, President Emmanuel Macron to be invited to BRICS so that he can have some or continue uh, with France's some hold on the African continent and some of the countries that they did colonize. But I like what one of the analysts that she spoke to said. She said it also is disrespect to the African continent. And I think I agree with her analysis mm. of it all. She says uh, the fact that he invited himself and told Pretoria that he would like to receive an invite for this BRICS summit, um, you know, also sent a message from France to Africa that, in fact, uh, you know, we, we still want to impose ourselves on the continent as France, despite, you know, the, the type of sticky history that we have with um, the African continent. I don't know if you, if, you, if you thought she was right in that analysis of it all, or maybe I'm being very emotional as an African myself. <laughs> How can you not be emotional, Masako? How can you not be emotional? I, I think it was a form of disrespect and a, a condescending tone that the French president put out there. And uh, like she said, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, 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 Nicole, or, uh, who spoke to us earlier, uh, Natalie, my apologies, uh, saying that she was uh, very appreciative of President Sarah Maposa taking a strong stand to say this is a meeting of the BRICS and nations. Uh, and and that's just it. So, it, I mean, it ties in quite nicely with the protests that Heidi covered uh, yesterday, uh, the different groupings that are getting together, raising a number of concerns. Um, what kind of groupings were you engaging and what were their concerns? Yes, so uh, I think on day one of the BRICS summit, we didn't see many, um, you know, many protests. I think there were about two or three protests. Um, and then very soon after that, uh, literally the next day, we actually saw um, a large group of people coming through. So it was actually um, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Um, you had people from uh, the west of Africa, the west of, of Nigeria, in fact. Um, you had people from Ukraine, of course. And then you had a very large group of people coming through um, about climate change. So they were, uh, they, they decided to group together and uh, show their dissatisfaction to the fact that BRICS nations need to urgently address climate change. Uh, they even went as far as speaking about uh, the fact that uh, China is not assisting when it comes to uh, really going greener, speaking about a pipeline project. Uh, that it has endorsed and uh, their dissatisfaction to uh, the fact that this is only going to further deteriorate our environment. I mean, if you look at what's currently happening in um, Greece, for example, it's just because I just come from there, but the wildfires, um, you know, all of this is environmental impact. Europe has experienced its hottest uh, summer ever recorded. Uh, this is all part of global warming and global change that uh, we perhaps don't want to really address face on. So these groupings were really saying something needs to be done about this. As much as the BRICS summit speaks about trade, economic development, and really looking about economic growth and all things related to the economy, we also need to speak about the environment because it's one thing to have an economy growing, but if you don't have an environment uh, or to a planet to grow the economy, it just completely defeats the purpose. Yeah. And it's such a significant point to say that, yes, as much as there is a uh, climate change agenda that's currently underway and countries need to adopt to that, sign to that, whatever it might be, what are we doing as BRICS nations to say this is how we are going to change it? And South Africa 
is a very important one because we've been, we have been uh, looked at to say, what are you going to do about your coal-fired power stations? Because you're now trying to repurpose some of them because you have an energy crisis. Uh, something needs to be done about that. What was also interesting is that you had uh, the widows of the Marikana massacre even going uh, to protest. Uh, they have indicated that they want President Cyril Ramaphosa to urgently intervene and do something about the fact that they feel as though justice has not been served, uh, despite how many years later. Uh, so there were many different groupings really coming out and saying that uh, this is what they're unhappy about. For example, um, you had uh, people from Pakistan saying that they've had their leader there for the past 15 years and nothing has been done to remove him. Uh, and people said, but how is this related to BRICS? But in some way or another, you know, all these world leaders can in some way have discussions with these countries and say, perhaps, you know, you need to relook at this, your people are suffering or whatever it might be. So, um, you know, there was also a lot of negativity from the public. When I was just looking on YouTube, people were saying, but what does this matter? Of course it matters, because if you have a summit of this magnitude here, you are going to have people that are dissatisfied and find that specific opportunity to raise this. I think what was rather unfortunate is that nobody heard them. It was very few media there. There were no government officials or anybody to receive their memorandums, the various memorandums. So uh, the one question that I did pose to one of the protesters was, do you feel as though this protest is in vain because nobody's here to sign your memorandum or to hear what you have to say? Everybody is locked in the convention center and they've actually moved you away because that area has been declared a red zone. And they've said, well, you, you know, ENCA is here, so somewhere, somehow, somebody's going to, to listen to us. Yeah, and that's the big thing, Masako, because I think one of the interesting nuances that I also picked up in this particular uh, discourse over the last three days is the arrangement of the BRICS countries is such that they are together on the premise of mutual beneficial um, uh, agreements or trade and investment and when it comes to uh, political standing, governance uh, and all of those things they then retreat to their national standing and I find it quite interesting that uh, people say that uh, they've actually been successful in being able to separate the mutual benefiting uh, factors with their principles as an individual state outside of BRICS. Um, I don't know if you picked up on that nuance and what you would have thought of it. I did uh, pick up on that nuance, Rofiwa, but uh, you know, for me, what was what what was also interesting is the interviews that you have been having, uh, Rofiwa, with the ministers that signed some agreements uh, since that uh, official state visit by uh, President Xi Jinping in Pretoria, which was just <coughs> hours preceding to the actual um, a summit beginning uh, uh, later on that uh, afternoon, uh, while other leaders were also um, landing at the Vatikloof Air Force base, President Cyril Ramaphosa was hosting his Chinese counterpart. And we know that uh, um, Minister Khosian Saramokhopa of uh, the Electricity Minister Khosian Saramokhopa uh, also signed some agreements with China. There were also signatures by uh, Minister Togotis Diza of Agriculture. And a short while ago, you spoke to uh, Minister, um, uh, 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 um, I'm forgetting his name, Sitezi Galala. And uh, Rafiwa, I'm interested to know, uh, in terms of your analysis of what they've told you, you said that uh, there was one analyst you spoke to who said that the apartheid government had built our um, uh, ports a certain way and that was a way to protect the country. It was a security building of the ports and not necessarily for travel. But, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, with a country that has been in democracy for almost 30 years, is it still a good enough excuse for our government to give us that the apartheid government had built things a certain way? But at the same time, Rafiwa, the uh, debate around South Africa probably just relying too much on China with all the things that we've signed, including the signatures uh, when it comes to our power crisis here uh, in South Africa. There's also that debate about whether or not we rely too much on China. You know, I'm going to start with your China point first because it's in my mind. I spoke to a journalist from CGTN earlier on, a senior business correspondent, and he said that he had, they had um, the state minister, a counterpart to Hussein Saramakhopa, if you will, uh, engage the media on South Africa's in electricity crisis. And, you know, while China is more than happy to provide the emergency electricity equipment and assist where they can, ultimately, and these 
these were his words, it is up to South Africa and South Africans to sort out their own energy issues, you know. And it does speak, I guess, to the reliance or heavy reliance of uh, South Africa on China for various interventions when it comes to the energy crisis uh, and other issues. But I must tell you, Masako, many other developing nations have relied on China for um, um, assistance in different sectors um, and agreements being signed like we've seen this week. The problem with that is that China's economy is no longer growing the way that it was three years ago and in itself has many uh, internal economic uh, challenges uh, that they're dealing with. Um, so that that's an interesting one to see. But yes, uh, the point that was being made by the ministers in my conversations with them is that the different departments are starting to work um, in conjunction with one another and no longer in silos. The fact that you're going to have the Border Management Authority say that we've got a problem at our ports of entry, National Treasury approving funding, then Minister Zigalala approving the fact that, I mean, uh, um, confirming that a project has now started to uh, remedy what they say was because of apartheid. I mean, we could have a debate if 30 years later something is still because of uh, the previous regime and would be here all night, Masako. But thank you. Uh, to both you and Heidi Jokos for engaging uh, me on this uh, roundtable. I think it was important for us to consolidate all of the content uh, that we've created as journalists, uh, but has also been uh, consumed by us and by our viewers. I'm going to bow out from the Santon Convention Center, Masako, and leave it to the rest of the team uh, to end off the evening coverage, that being Sipa Mandla Goge and Heidi Jokos. All right, thanks, Rafia. We'll catch up uh, probably um, tomorrow when you give us a business report. It'll probably be something about how uh, the markets have reacted to um, BRICS, if they react at all. Let's take you to a short ad break. Of course, All Angles does continue on the other side of this. And at some point, we have to take you back uh, to uh, plenary at the BRICS Summit at the Santon Convention Center. We're expecting a media briefing by the United Nations.